I need to show people that it's okay to have somebody who looks like me mm -hmm. in this job. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure I'm developing a pipeline mm -hmm. of the second, the third, the fourth. Mm -hmm. So between wanting to do a great job so I can just take this whole notion away that a woman or a black person or a black woman can't do this big uh, job, I have to be great. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot that goes into being great. But then I have to make sure there's a pipeline. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that somebody else is coming up. Let me tell you about our guest today. Uh, Sint Marshall is uh, amazing. She literally for 35 years was a part of AT&T, um, rose to be the senior vice president of uh, human resources and the chief diversity officer. From there, she's now the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, an amazing accomplishment for anyone. She was the first black female NBA CEO in history. She's a dear friend, a uh, regular speaker at the Global Leadership Summit. She has a book out called You've Been Chosen, Thriving Through the Unexpected. Get ready to be blessed. I want to welcome my good friend, Sent. This is a dream come true to have you on the podcast. You are... Um, you're an extraordinary leader, one of the best of the best, and um, you're even a better person. So Thank you. Oh, my a, goodness. It's an honor to have you um, to share with our leadership community. Thank you for being here today. I am so glad to be here with you. Yeah. Well, well it's Oh, my a, gosh. I, I, um, uh, I want to just mention your book again. We're going to talk about it some, but you've been chosen. Yes. Thriving Through the Unexpected. I just want to say to our community, um, this is a book that has a message that will impact your life written by a person worthy of learning from and emulating. And so we'll talk more about the book. I just want to make sure that we um, let our community know about it. But I want to start more in the beginning of your leadership journey, even before you had a title. Okay. When was the first time that you recognized you had influence and you could make a difference leading? Okay, now my sister will tell you my oldest sister, Cassandra, will say it's when we were growing up mm -hmm. and I just took over all the play activity mm -hmm. and told everybody, you know, who to get in the red wagon, where we were going around the corner and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So she likes to tell that story. I remember it just a little bit, but I don't remember being as, you know, aggressive as she said I was. And I was basically bossing them around. Yeah, okay? I, bet, I bet she might have, might be telling the truth. Yeah, she, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But I do remember in high school uh -huh. um, being the senior class president okay. and really having to lead and actually having to lead us through a little bit of adversity at our high school. Mm -hmm. uh, when And I went to a you know pretty um, diverse high school, mm -hmm. uh, but we needed to kind of diversify our you know leadership council. Mm -hmm. And so we took some steps uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I was the first African-American to be the senior class president. Wow. And my buddy Terry was the first African-American to be the student body president. Mm -hmm. And it's something we actually planned mm -hmm. because I, I decided I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I had to lead that class and it was okay. awesome. And so I learned a lot of lessons that I still use to this day. Mm -hmm. And then I learned a lot of leadership lessons at church, mm -hmm. all my church activities and being vice president of the choir and all that. So I learned leadership at an early age. So I, I think at, at any time, being the first of something in leadership matters. Being not only black, but being female, probably that was almost like a double first yes. in, as president. Yes. I'm guessing that there are a lot of people in our community that may be similar. They may be the first woman in ministry in a place where that wasn't as common, right. or they may be the first 23-year-old to ever right. have a real leadership position, or the first one to start um, a business in their family. Can you tell me, as someone who broke a lot of ground, because that wasn't the only time you're the first, no, something significant no, a lot of firsts. in your life, right? A lot of firsts. Um, what does someone who's the first in a leadership role um, need to know? What do they do? What, what have you learned? What I've learned is usually being the first is something that other people talk about. Mm -hmm. I never really pay attention to it. Most of the time, I don't even know it hmm. because you don't. I mean, you end up, you know, for whatever reason, where the, the Lord puts it on you or whatever, mm -hmm. you go out for something, you make it or somebody selects you for something. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to, you, you know, what you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I never focus on that. But when somebody brings it to my attention, mm -hmm. the first thing I think about is, okay, I can't be the last. Mm -hmm. I'm the first, but I'm not going to be the last. And then I think about what needs to happen in order for me not to be 
last. Hmm. So I need to do a great job. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I need to show people that it's okay to have somebody who looks like me mm -hmm. in this job. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure I'm developing a pipeline mm -hmm. of the second, the third, the fourth. Mm -hmm. So between wanting to do a great job so I can just take this whole notion away that a woman or a black person or a black woman can't do this big uh, job, I have to be great. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot that goes into being great. But then I have to make sure there's a pipeline. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that somebody else is coming up. And that's what I focus on. Well, so that's really interesting because immediately you're not just talking about what you need to do, but you're talking about empowering other people. Oh, it's all about that. And, it's all about that. Many leaders would miss that because they would think, I need to do this and I need to prove myself. And you're already talking about others around you. Well, that's why we're leaders, that's to right. serve. That's right. That's right. I mean, leadership but, is all about serving. Yes, but that's not obvious to everyone. So I want to make it really clear right. that you're immediately thinking of others. Can we talk about complicated? issues. Can we just kind of go there together? Oh, go. Okay. Let go. So in what I do, the first time that we were, we were really asking, um, we we're praying that we could raise up or find a female leader in a role that, that hadn't been there traditionally before. Awesome. And so we had a candidate that was interviewing against a man and they're like going, do you want to try to tip the role toward her? And the, I told him, you know, absolutely not. No. What I want you to do is I want you to hire the best person in the room. Yes. And then in the, any time there was someone like, let's say it was a female leader coming in, or maybe it was someone who is, um, uh, has a different racial back, uh, is di different racially yes. or a different background, or maybe even a different kind of education, whatever. Um, I always thought, and tell me if this is accurate and put it in your own words. I always thought, I don't want someone who comes in that's a woman first and a leader second, or someone who's black first or white first or Asian first and a leader second. I want something, someone coming in that is a leader or a pastor first who just happens to be black. Yes. Or just happens to be female. Can you tell me what's the difference when we get that mixed up and why does that matter if it does? It, oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you're looking at it. And it's it's the right way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will, I will be so bold as to say it is the right way. Mm -hmm. Because what you look for is competence. Mm -hmm. You want somebody who is the right match for the job, mm -hmm. who has the skill set to do the job, who has a proven ability to lead. Mm -hmm. And so you look at all of that first. Mm -hmm. And as you know, at at and I hired a lot of people over the years. I mean, I did it for a living. Okay. And you look for competence first. Mm -hmm. And then if that person just so happens to be a person of color or different from the others around the table, that's a plus. Mm -hmm. Because in order to be successful, I truly believe you need a diverse group of people around the table, diverse backgrounds, diverse thoughts, all of that. Or you're always limited. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you just go for, oh, we got to have a woman in this job, mm -hmm. or we got to have a black person in this job, mm -hmm. or we got to have an LGBTQ person in this job, mm -hmm. and that person is not qualified, mm -hmm. you have done a disservice to them first. Mm -hmm to the people they are to be serving because mm -hmm. the last thing people need is an ineffective leader. Mm -hmm. And you've done a disservice, frankly, to the whole culture. Mm -hmm. So it's got to start with competence and being qualified. And there are people out there that are competent and qualified. That's very true. That's very true. So 35 years at AT&T. Yes, almost 36. So that's, is that crazy? That, that it really is. So I got a, I got a billion questions about that. I, I'm going to try to limit it to two. Okay. The first one is you started relatively low in the organization and you rose to almost the very, very top. Yes, correct. The top. What yes. did you do when you were starting out that enabled you to quickly rise in influence? What? Because so, we got a ton of people right now that... Um, are newer? Yes. What were the qualities that you brought that stood out? Okay, I did a few things. Uh, first, I learned our business. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I came in on a fast track management program. Uh, so I had opportunities to be promoted and all that. And I actually turned down a few promotions, actually four in my career. And one, the first couple, it was just because I wanted to learn our business. Mm -hmm. uh, I was young, 21 years old. I started leading people, so I started out supervising operators, but then I had an opportunity to take my boss's job a year and a half into it. A year and, and a half into it. Yes, mm -hmm. and I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that because I wanted to just learn our business because mm -hmm. I knew I, you know, I would climb in the business, but I wanted to know mm -hmm. what was going on there. I just didn't want to be one of these bosses that had to just totally rely on their people, which you do rely on your people, but you want to know about the area so you can truly serve them. And so that's one thing I did. I truly learned the business for the sole purpose of being able to serve my people. 
So for example, one time I had a big group of installers and technical people and all that who were actually like three levels below me, but I went to pole climbing school. The union could not believe it. They actually came out, took pictures. They threw me a big party on my last day. Now, I didn't need to know how to climb a pole. I didn't need to know that area of the business, but I did it so I could serve the people, so I could have empathy. So if I'm negotiating with the union on a contract, I wouldn't know exactly what the people So to be clear, you're talking about climbing a telephone pole. Oh, I can climb a telephone pole. Okay, I just want to make sure. I still have the boots. Because there's there's people that climb poles like that's a metaphor of like climbing up in the business. But you're talking about oh, no, you no. went to school to learn how to climb a pole. Yeah, you. Go, I mean, you can't really find them that much anymore. <laughs> you can't really find them that much anymore, but the old wooden poles like, and all 95% that. 95% sure that's what you're saying. I just want to make sure. Oh, okay. oh, I have a picture. I'll okay. show, well, all you'll right. see a picture later okay. of me actually up on the pole that okay. the union actually took. So I did that because I wanted to really serve the people and have empathy. Mm. So I have... So what I call the three L's of leadership. And so this is what I learned early in my career and I'm still focused on it. The three L's of leadership. In order for me to be a very effective leader, Mm -hmm. I have to listen to the people, Mm -hmm. learn from the people Mm -hmm. and love the people. Mm -hmm. So listen to them at a level where I'm truly engaged with them and I can actually hear what they're actually not saying. And so that's a deep level of listening because mm-hmm. people won't tell you everything, mm-hmm. but as a leader, you just got to figure some stuff out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then you have to learn from them. Mm-hmm. So that's what the pole climbing was all about. Learn their environment, mm-hmm. learn what they really want, what they need every day, all of that. And then love the people is the biggest one mm-hmm. and love them as people, not as employees. Mm-hmm. So love that person who gets up in the morning They're in bed, all the dreams they have, the cultures they have, the backgrounds they have, the baggage they have. That's the person who gets up and walks into our doors in the morning or shows up on the screen. And you got to love them. And you have to know them and meet them where they are Mm. as people, Mm. not as a person that will go into a phone booth and put a big M on their chest for Mavs or T on their chest for AT&T. You got to love the person who gets up out of bed in the morning. And if you truly love them as people and you serve that person, you'll be a great leader and you'll get anything out of them. So so it's my three L's. I'm so frustrated right now because I have a thousand questions. I can't (laughs) answer them all. I can't ask them all. (laughs) I almost need need help very clearly. So back to something you said about, and, and based on my reading research, when you stepped into the CEO role of the Dallas Mavericks does a ridiculously complicated time. Very complicated. Re- re- very challenging. And I think it's true to say that you tried to meet with every significant leader one-on-one to listen, to learn, and to love them. I met with every single employee in the organization. Every single- Not just the leaders, every single employee. And I would start out with the same statement. I'd say- Give me your story. Give me your whole life story. Tell me about yourself. Mm -hmm. Nine out of 10 times, they would say something like, this is my fifth season at the Mavs, Mm -hmm. or this is my 10th season at the Mavs. Mm -hmm. And I said, were you born here? Mm -hmm. Were you born like here at the Dallas Mavericks? I want to know your story. Mm -hmm. And it would always catch them off guard because hardly, I guess no one ever asked them that. And so then they would tell me their story. I said, I want you to kind of like back up like from the beginning. Where were you born? I want the whole story. I want to get to know you. So this is... This is so natural to you, or at least it's learned and now part of who you are, but this is not natural to most leaders. Most leaders would want to come and say, now, let me tell you about me right?" and bring their resume. And did you learn this principle? Did you, is it true to who you are? Where'd that come from? Probably both. It is true to who I am. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed over the years is that I was becoming more and more of an effective leader mm-hmm. when I did things like that. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes I could start a new job. I had 15 different jobs in my 13,088 days at mm-hmm. AT&T. Okay? And so every now and then, you know, you get in a job quickly and you just hit it and you just go. And if there was, if I didn't feel right, it was always because I didn't really stop mm-hmm. to get to know the people. And so then I'd have to to back up. So now I've just learned I have to do that. I have to start that way. I don't care what the crisis is. I don't care how pressing the issues are. Because at the end of the day, people produce results. So you got to get to know So I can't even imagine how valued they all felt to have time with you 
and for you to listen to them tell their story. Oh, they loved it. Yes. And in fact, so I would start out that way, and then I and then we talk about a lot of stuff in between, and then I would end the same way. Mm-hmm. I would say, "Tell me where you see yourself five years from now." Mm-hmm. So it was all, personally all and about, professionally. All about them. Personally yes. and professionally. Mm-hmm. Because I want to know the dreams they had mm-hmm. uh, for for themselves, for their families, all of that. Because my job as a leader mm-hmm. is to serve that whole person mm-hmm. and to uh, create a leadership team around the table that will serve all these people. And so I I, I know the folks. I just did this with our interns uh, earlier this week and last week. With the interns. I met with most of them. So that's a, they that's, loved a, that's another level. That, oh, it's that's a whole like, other level because now they're posting on in you know they're posting right. you know they, they're into all this social now media. You're street cred. Oh, I'm getting street cred. Like they're posting <laughs> right. stuff on social yeah, yeah. media. And, and yeah. one day I had on like the uh, a soccer jersey uh-huh. and my, you know, high tops and stuff. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's pictures out there. It's kind of cute though. <laughs> it's kind of cute. Go. There you I'm go. Looking, I'm looking young and like. You're looking gets, fly. Yeah, I'm looking right. fly. I'm not even sure if that's the right way to say it. but Oh, I that is. That's, okay. that's actually okay. what I say. I mean, sure. I got four kids. Okay. Okay. So I got to be fly every time they'll I leave keep, the house. keep you in the game, right? Yes, they will. So, okay. I love that. So you're, you're listening. Then you said something that really stood out to me and I, because intuitively, this is something I, I look for, but I've never talked about this with someone. You said you're listening for what's not said. Yes. Because sometimes you just know, I mean, if you're intuitive, mm-hmm. and, and and all leaders should be, and sometimes it's not natural, but you pray about it. The mm-hmm. Lord will give you discernment mm-hmm. and intuition about the people you're leading. And so sometimes I just want to get in there and get real close to them. And I have like two brown chairs in my office. Sometimes they'll sit at the table and sometimes I'm like, ah, let's move over Mm -hmm. to these chairs and I'll put them kind of close up and I just listen. And I'm like, okay, it's something they're not saying. And so sometimes I'll call it out Mm -hmm. and I'll say, okay. And I I just had to do this recently with one of my leaders. I said, okay, you got a little baggage. I said, something happened to you once. I said, let me tell you about something that happened to me and I'll tell a story. And I said, tell me what happened to you. What keeps you from just totally, totally being authentic and going all in? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And then they'll start telling me stories. Mm -hmm. And it's because as I listened, I just knew there was more to the story and there was something that wasn't being said Mm -hmm. that's influencing how they do Mm -hmm. their jobs. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten good at it. You have gotten very good at it. Yes. And I'm sitting next to you thinking, I'd like to work for you. Aww. Meaning it's just thank and, you. And I don't say that about many people, but they're just there's just a genuineness about you. And so I love these people. I truly you, like you know, love these shows. people. It shows. So your book, you've been chosen. Yes. I want to try to I want to try to get it's just complicated for me to do, but what I want to try to do is I want to get the why behind you and then the how. So you you taught your mom was very special. She's wonderful. And so there's there's likely both something in your childhood that shaped you. And then there's also a how, meaning you may be more naturally loving or more empathetic or more care, caring, but we can all get better. Yes. And so I want to start with the the what or the why maybe behind your story. And then I want to talk a little bit about the how of how we can actually become more like that. So let's talk about the, the what or the why. Um, and you, you talk, and I'm baiting you because you talk about it in your amazing book, but tell me a little bit about your mom and your childhood and how that shaped you to become the leader you are today. My mom is amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's 87 years old Mm -hmm. now, still in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, But she left Birmingham, Alabama when I was a baby Mm -hmm. because she wanted her kids. She didn't want her kids growing up uh, with a lot of segregation and all the stuff that was going on at the time. Uh, So she had this vision and these big dreams for us. Mm -hmm. And so we landed in a public housing project, Mm -hmm. uh, saw a lot of bad, crazy stuff. Uh, I actually, we were poor very poor. Mm -hmm. I saw my father shoot a man in the head in Mm self-defense because this teenager came to our door, actually somebody that, you know, we're growing up with. And yeah, I grew up kind of rough. And, but I had, I do believe I had a good childhood. I would describe it as a good childhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother had us in church all the time. Uh, She put two books in my hand at an early age, Mm -hmm. a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other, Mm -hmm. probably in that order. Mm -hmm. And just said, Kind of like, keep your head in these two books and you'll make it out. Mm -hmm. And so when this thing happened at our house when I was in the seventh grade, um, my father actually shot back in Mm self-defense. This guy came to our house. I happened to be the one standing on his side, right? So it was in self-defense of me. And 
my mother figured out a way for us to go to school because with all the chaos and everything, Mm -hmm. we had to be sequestered in the house. Mm -hmm. And education was everything for my mom. Mm -hmm. And so you'll hear me talk a lot about Mm -hmm. education matters. Zip code doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were growing up poor. We were in the public housing projects. But I got a great education and my mother saw to it that we got to school every day. And so when this stuff happened and we had to stay home, my mother figured out how to get me to school. She had a uniformed police officer take me to school Mm -hmm. in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And he would show up and ask me if I wanted to ride in the police car or he'd ride the bus with me. And it was beautiful because he did exactly what was written on his car to protect and to serve. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And so so they got me to school every day. Mm -hmm. Four years later, my parents got an ugly, violent, you know, divorce. My father broke my nose when I was 15. And so we had to leave our house. And so when we came back from the summer, my mother's prayer, she's a praying woman. Mm -hmm. My mother's prayer was that we would make it back home before school started because she had three in school. I was going to be a junior in high school, head cheerleader, all that. But I get my nose broken. Mm -hmm. So we get back home a week before school starts, prayer answered. Uh, Just about everything is gone in the house. So as teenagers, we're all in uproar about that. And I'll never forget when my mom did that day because we're like where are our trophies because you know I ran track I was sent to sprint you know our trophies all of our stuff school is getting ready to start no one I'm calling you sent to sprint you call me sent to sprint you call me sent to sprint it's it's, it's all it's yes yes forever okay so so she literally just told us to be quiet so it was just quiet in the house and she said all I want is peace of mind God will provide he will take care of us Mm -hmm. and as a teenager we're like well we need our stuff I mean school is getting ready to start but you know what Stuff started showing back up to the house. He took care of us. My mother told me to go to school with this brace on my nose. Mm. I went to school. I'm cheering and everything like nothing had happened. And three teachers and a principal saw me, embraced me, found out what was going on in our family, and knew that my mother had this desire for her kids, this great desire. I already had, you know, some before me uh, starting out in school and stuff and They embraced me and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm all about the village. Mm -hmm. And they embraced my mom Mm -hmm. and she worked with these people. And I ended up graduating at the top of my school district. Mm -hmm. And I got five full scholarships to the college of my choice. Is that crazy? This is a fascinating story. So on one hand, you grew up in poverty and saw and experienced extreme violence. And yet you had a good childhood. I did. And in many ways, the cards were stacked against you. And you were a class president and had offers to the best colleges around. So that's a, the, there's, there's a, there's an attitude of overcoming. There's yes. a positivity, there's yes. a faith, there's something different because other people who grow up in that same scenario don't end up in a, in a healthy place. Right. Uh, and some people who grow up with a whole lot of stuff and don't end up in a healthy place. Don't end up in a healthy right. place. But it, it's, so it's, it's mindset, about, it's perspective. It's mindset, it's yes. perspective. But the way I describe it, and even when people ask me, what is your book about? Mm-hmm. I said, my book is about how God mm-hmm. and great people always showed up in my life. And how my mother is the village. And how my mother was always open mm-hmm. to inviting other people in and letting Mm-hmm. other people in because she knew she couldn't do it by herself as strong as she was, as many jobs as mm-hmm. she had. Cause my mother is a strong woman mm-hmm. and a strong woman of faith. So, you know, other people loved you and believed in you and helped you succeed. And so you want to do that for other people. Yes, mm-hmm. I knew it. I mean, that was mm-hmm. my experience. Every time we were laid out, there was always a hand picking mm-hmm. us up mm-hmm. and I know that's how the world is supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. That's why my theme song in life is Ain't No Mountain High Enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Marvin Gaye, Tammy yeah. Terrell version. Okay, you, the fast are, version. Is Sent the Sprint also Sent the Singer? No, or but you, I can dance. Okay, you can dance. Oh, I got moves. <laughs> I can dance. The, sent the Shaker. Yeah, that's right. right. I can move. Okay. And so, but that's why that's my theme song, yes. is because there ain't no mountain high enough yeah. to keep me from getting it. to you. I, I mean, you just... Me. So I want to I want to fast forward uh-huh. th- and it is, I'm, I apologize. Thirty five years. I want to ask you about how and why you last. Okay. I want you know there's so many, but I want to fast forward to the Dallas Mavericks because this yes. is fascinating to me. So you're at AT and T. You're not you're not in the NBA. And Mark Cuban. No. And I had retired. You, and you retired. I retired after and 36 so years. That's enough. Mark Cuban sees something in you, which is is fascinating. I want to hear a little bit about. What he saw, and then when you came in, it had to be, uh, there's got to be 
a thousand crossover principles of leadership that are, that are true everywhere. Yes. And there had to be a thousand new things that you hadn't seen before. Can you tell me a little bit about that journey? Yes. So when Mark called me and I did not know him, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, everything broke out at the Mavs and mm-hmm. somebody told him my name came up a few times and I get this call from this person who I really did not know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I went to see him and so we kind of... You know, he told me the whole story and I'm thinking, Lord, I don't know if Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this, Mm -hmm. but it's a long story, but truly the Lord orchestrated Mm -hmm. the whole thing. So Mm -hmm. he made it very clear to me, this is what I was supposed to do Mm -hmm. at this point in time. And I thought I was getting ready to do something else. That's Mm -hmm. why you got to, you know, you got to be in touch with Mm -hmm. the man. Okay. So I ended up accepting the job, not knowing a thing about the business of basketball. Mm -hmm. Huge basketball fan, Mm -hmm. but didn't know a thing about the business of basketball. And Mark told me, don't worry about that. He said, I need a leader. Mm -hmm. And basically his mandate was to transform the culture. He said, I I know about the work you've done at AT AT&T. I need that here. I need a leader. I will teach you and others will teach you the business of basketball. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay. And at that time, I really didn't know there was so much business to basketball. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that that goes on than what's on the court, okay? But I did know how to lead. Mm -hmm. And I basically laid out a vision, Mm -hmm. a set of values, Mm -hmm. and the values spell crafts. Character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety. Mm -hmm. All based on my personal and Can safety. You say those is fit- again, one more time, and we're going to put them in the uh, the leader guide. But we just say okay. it one more time slowly. Character, mm-hmm. respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety, both physical and emotional mm-hmm. safety. So those are the values that I laid out for the employees, and and I laid it all out for them before I went to talk to the media because mm-hmm. your people shouldn't hear things. Uh, out in the public before you tell them, okay, if you can help it, okay? And I so I met with all of them first. We laid out our vision. We laid out our values. And I laid out a 100-day plan, shared that with everybody, and then said, okay, I need a diverse group of leaders around the table, and I'm going to meet with every single employee in here. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the recipe. That's what we did. The things I didn't know about the business of basketball, I, I know a whole lot now. But I have people around the table that taught me. My colleagues, there are 30 NBA teams, so 29 of my colleagues around, you know, the country. So many of them called me on day one Mm -hmm. because the competition is only on the court. They wanted me to be successful. They want the Mavs to be successful. And they told me so much stuff. And they still do about what I need to know about the business of basketball. Mm -hmm. But my job truly is to lead. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I do. So I think that Mark is brilliant and to believe that you're a great, great leader and you can come in and learn the business of basketball, that's just, that's classic leadership. It really is because it, when I think back at it, I'm like... It doesn't make a lot of sense. At first I thought he lost his mind. Yeah. Once I started no. learning about it, I'm like, has he gone crazy? But he he is brilliant. He really is it, it, a it, business it was, genius. It was a, it was a move that almost no one would have made. Right. And he saw something in you and, and you were the right person for it long before you maybe even thought you would be a candidate for right. it. Right. And, and here's what's great. Because you know, when I found out that, you know, when they start talking about me being the first black female CEO of an NBA team, my boss never thought about that. Mm-hmm. He didn't know that just like I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. it. It's to the point you made earlier. He, he was looking for a yes. leader. Yes. He was looking for competence, yep. somebody with a proven track record of culture transformation mm-hmm. and all that. He was not thinking about right. the fact that I that he was basically putting the first black woman oh, in place. Did you feel weight? Because if you hadn't done well, then it might have been a while before there was a second. What? Yeah. Well, you know what? It's I didn't feel a lot of weight. I mean, I think about it, but I knew I had to do a good job. But I knew I would do a good job mm-hmm. because I know the recipe. Mm-hmm. It's not all on me. Mm-hmm. It, it is truly. Mm-hmm. I. It's just not all on me. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I get up in the morning, I know I got a whole team of people, and I just don't feel. The pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew, you know, we had a lot of media stuff going on and all that. So I just knew we had to work at a pretty fast clip and, and I'm type A and I'm a workaholic, uh, but I actually integrate. So I have my family. So I, I got a pretty good balance. I mean, at this mm-hmm. point, mm-hmm. I mean, I had 36 years of experience, well, 37 by that point. So I didn't feel the pressure. 
I know I have to do a good job. Mm -hmm. I know we will do a good job and we will do a good job. Mm -hmm. It's not just about me. I have learned that. Mm -hmm. I have learned that. Gone are the days when I had all the pressure on me Mm -hmm. because those days led to an ulcer, led to just all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Gone are those days. I rely on the people. Yes. So I I want our community just to let this soak in for a minute because what what you're saying is, is brilliant. So you're walking into an industry that you love but don't understand. And so you know that if you come in and if you cast a very clear vision, if you create the right culture by clearly articulating, communicating, demonstrating the right values, choose the right people who will create the right systems, then you can change the direction to go in the vision that's desired. And that applies to Everywhere. Any type of organization. Everywhere. Anywhere you go. Everywhere. Anywhere in, you go. in fact, when I uh, talked to a, a new employee one time, he said, Sin, it never dawned on me the importance of values. Mm-hmm. And he was one of the new employees. He could feel the difference mm-hmm. between kind of what, you know, what happened, you know, when he walked in, how it was, and then a year or so after we were there. Mm-hmm. And he said, I never thought that that should be something I should ask an employer about. Mm-hmm. What are the values? Mm-hmm. And our values, and here's what I told our team. I said, these values will be on the walls because, mm-hmm. you know, you want to have it laid out mm-hmm. and all that. And I got mm-hmm. the hashtag for each one of them. Right. Like authenticity is hashtag do you. Mm-hmm. And we describe what that means to do you and all that. But I told them these values will not just hang on the walls, but they will operate in the halls. Mm-hmm. And here's what that looks like. Mm-hmm. And then we'll give examples. And then I'll say, and we will call each other out when we don't see it. Mm-hmm. And so when we had our big 100-day plan, we would have these ceremonies all in the middle of the floor to kind of like check it off. And mm-hmm. so, because we were doing this as a team, right? Everybody was all in. Mm-hmm. And one day I was getting ready to check off a compensation item. And I'm all excited about it and I'm pumped up and I'm juiced. And the people are just looking at me. And I'm like, okay, something's going on. And so somebody raised their hand and they said, sent. Now I'm the CEO. And they said, uh, we can't really check that off. We know you're excited, but we can't check that mm-hmm. off today. And I'm like, why? What happened? They said, um, we don't know what that looks like yet. And then I looked over at our HR person and she goes, Sent, we're not, we're not talking to everybody until mm-hmm. later today and tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I got ahead of myself. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that happened, but I got ahead of myself. But the beautiful thing is they called me out. Mm-hmm. And they called me out. I'm like, okay, well, what day can we check it off? And they all talked and they said, okay, we need to come back on Monday. I said, okay, we'll come back on Monday. They truly called me out on it. So I they love had permission. That. They had permission. Yes. They knew that. You wanted them to. It's about characters, about yes. integrity, yep. all of that. And, you know, and trust and transparency. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so they called me out. Mm-hmm. And then I had to ask my uh, HR person. I said, what happened? And she said, I don't know, because I told you. I said, I guess I forget. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was my fault. That's it was good. totally my fault. That's good. And that's what I can admit it is my fault. So this podcast is all about leadership. And yes. and we'll speak into all, I mean, all sorts of different people. We'll be in boardrooms. And, and so there's no question where I stand on my faith. And um, I never hide it, but I lead with leadership. Yes. And um, so we've got people that are uh, people of faith, people that um, would be of different faith, yes. people that um, don't believe anything, that you know don't don't even believe in a god. Okay, but I uh, I like your style. You're um, you obviously we share the same um, Christian faith, and sometimes there are people in the business world that might share our beliefs that are um, less effective than those that are more effective. Yes. I feel like you're very effective. What what makes someone, what are the qualities that someone could actually be a person of faith and lead well, being a good influence on others rather than maybe turning them away from the faith? First of all, I think authenticity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know who I am. Mm-hmm. I know whose I am. Mm-hmm. And I don't shy away from that. Mm-hmm. Just like I wouldn't want anybody shying away from who they are. When we say authenticity, that applies to us too. Mm-hmm. I get to be me just like you get to be yes. you. And that's okay yes. because we need all of it. Yes. And I think there's a belief that I have that we truly need all of it at the table. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. people deserve to be able to work and thrive and be in a great place to work. Mm-hmm. No matter what their beliefs are, religious beliefs mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. We want people to be able to get the job done. Mm-hmm. And so I take pride in the ability that I can lead Lots of different people. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, Sent, can you come outside and pray with me? Mm -hmm. Because it literally would have to be outside. Mm -hmm. And I've had a, I had a chairman one time who'd call and say, Sent, come to my office. So I'd go to his office and he'd say, can you pray with me? Like, where's your Bible? 
And I said, my Bible is in my desk downstairs. Everybody knows where I keep it. I don't walk around a building with it. I'm not walking around a building laying hands on people. And so if somebody calls it out and they, they need it, fine. But it's not about that. It is about me living a life every day as a leader, one that is pleasing to God, mm-hmm. where I am loving his people, mm-hmm. all of his people, mm-hmm. no matter what their background backgrounds are. And leaders have mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I try to you do. You do that well. And, I try and, to. And, and, I don't get it right every day. No, I don't get it right because I'm biases. do, but you, you, do, right. you do it well. Again, I want to be careful because we'll talk off mic and we'll talk on mic, but you've been through a lot mm-hmm. in your life. And right now, at this very moment, you're going through a lot. Yes. My husband was diagnosed with multiple myeloma on Monday, Mm -hmm. uh, a blood cancer that's in his bone marrow and all that. So Mm -hmm. we just found that out on Monday. Yes. And so um, we're actually going to, we're going to, we're going to pray for Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. um, And I'm just curious because I know there are a lot of leaders out here right now that they've got their own version of that. It could be that they're bleeding out. Um, and barely can stay afloat. Yes. It could be they've got a lawsuit that they're facing. It could be that they've got that one employee that they just can't seem to remove out and can't can't get off the fence with. And it's, there's our toxic culture or yes. a bad marriage at home and whatever it is. Um, and they're hurting right now. Uh, how do you show up and lead well when you're hurting personally? Okay. And you know, you, you mentioned it earlier, the title of my book is mm-hmm. You've Been Chosen. Mm-hmm. And especially those of us that are in leadership, mm-hmm. we have been chosen. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been chosen. And I don't believe for a second that we're going to encounter anything mm-hmm. that uh, we can't handle mm-hmm. uh, because we all have each other. Uh, we have something working that's bigger than us, uh, whatever people want to call it. Mm -hmm. And so we know we've been chosen to be in our seats. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that all the time. My first job is to lead Mm -hmm. and different things have popped up, as you know, in my life. Mm -hmm. And one just popped up on Monday Mm -hmm. to try to take me off my game. Mm -hmm. And I can't have that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to deal with it. We have to stop and address it. Mm -hmm. But there is something bigger that I am called to do. Mm And I can't get sucked up in one circumstance that I know will come out just fine. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just having faith. Mm -hmm. But faith without works is dead. I mean, we got to work out the plan. We got to do what we got to do. Okay. And so, but I know I have to lead. Mm -hmm. It's just like I knew I had to be here today. I'm a part of all of this, a part of something big uh, that the Lord is doing, a part of something big that leaders need. And I can't just take some news I got on Monday and say, I'm not going to go and carry out the larger purpose. And so it's not always easy to do, Mm -hmm. but we have to rise above ourselves. I try my best and I don't get it right all the time, but I try my best to remember that I'm called to do something. So I want to tell our community, hang with me till the end. We're almost done, but I want to just take a moment and I want to tell you, thank you for being you. Um, For context, we're actually... At the Global Leadership Summit, as we're recording this, um, we're going to finish this, and I have to finish it relatively quickly because you're about to speak to hundreds of thousands of people yes. just a few days after your husband's diagnosed with with cancer, and you're here to serve because you are an others-oriented leader. Yes. You're a um, Christ-centered leader, yes. and it shows in what you do. So I want to say to our community, um, you want you want to you want to consume the resources from people that have lived the life that you want to be able to live. And this is someone who's overcome um, lots of odds and broken barriers and um, made amazing progress, added value to people uh, and created organizations that are, that are thriving today and done it with a great attitude, with a great family, with great life balance and with a very sincere faith. So the book is called you've been chosen and what I want to say to our community is I want you to feel it, that, that you have been chosen, meaning you have what it takes to do what you're called to do. You're special. You have very unique gifts. You're placed in a very unique environment to make a very real difference. I want you to feel it. I want you to believe it. If you can see someone who was raised um, and was you know, a victim of abuse and saw abuse and yet has an attitude to say it was a good childhood and was raised in poverty and yet... Uh, 
doesn't just rise out of it, but climbs out of it by hard work, integrity, faithfulness, endurance, uh, relationships. If you can get the right people around you um, and you can grow with the right resources, you can become a leader worth following. So be sure and get the leader guide. Go to life.church slash leadership podcast. We're going to um, give you information with her book as well as more information for her. And then we're going to close this thing out by praying with you for you. Kenny. And so I Thank don't want you. it to be weird to our community. So if you're not comfortable, um, you don't have to be a part of this. And it, But we're going to pray. God, thank you for sent, and um, we pray for her husband, Kenny. We thank you that she's seen healing in her family before, and we believe she'll see healing again. Touch his body and bring healing, we pray. Empower her, God, to continue to being a light in a dark world. Thank you for her and bless her in every way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And we just got better, amen. and you just got better, and everybody wins when the leader gets better.